and welcome to Flower Mount United Methodist Church. It is so good to be together. Even if we can't see each other physically, we are united together as a family of faith virtually. And so thank you for being here, checking in with us on Facebook Live. Uh, give us a wave, a, a heart, a handshake, uh, something to just let us know that you are here so we can connect with one another uh, due to the beauty of technology. And so we're so thankful for all of those behind the scenes who have made this happen this week. Um, we have been hard at work um, as your staff uh, trying to make sure that we can uh, connect all of us during these times of uncertainty and this epidemic, just knowing that we can be together this way, I think brings us all a sense of comfort right now. Absolutely. So this week we are continuing our sermon series, our Lenten sermon series. We are still in the season of Lent. We are still, uh, yes. And so the season of Lent is a time for us to reflect on our spirituality, to spend a little bit more time in contemplation. And uh, while some of us might be giving up more than we expected to give up for Lent, uh, we are continuing our sermon series called The Burdens We Carry. And right now, more than ever, it probably feels like those burdens are pretty heavy. Uh, but we're so glad that you're worshiping with us as we reflect on what it means uh, to, to contemplate morality this week, uh, but that we can still be together in worship and in praise uh, with our congregation, even if it's virtually. Yeah. And so please check out our website this week because we have literally gone to a virtual church this week. And I uh, want to invite you uh, to check out our YouTube channel for a variety of things that we will be posting from Facebook Live onto that um, as a way of continuing to be in connection as a faith community. We are ones who are gathered today to worship the holy in our lives and to spend the time to recognize that we are ones who may not understand fully uh, what is going on in our world in these unprecedented times, but we can turn to God, assured that God is a steadfast, holy, and loving presence in our lives. And so as our beautiful chorus leads us this morning, our musicians, we hear, holy, holy, holy.
Amen. Amen. In uncertain times, our faith might shake just a little bit, but we are a people of faith who are a part of a long history of people who have placed their courage and their faith on a firm foundation. And so we want to recite the Apostles' Creed, a traditional affirmation of faith that reminds us of the triune God, which our choir just sang about. Um, And we invite you to, to recite it. If you remember it, the word should be on your screen. But let us recite now our faith in the triune God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. reassuring it is to hear those words, um, to be assured that our God is with us, is active and at work in our lives at this time as the holiest of holies. And so I hope hearing these words and this music has given you the assurance um, that your God is at work in this world. And so it is that we come to a time, um, a time where we are reflecting certainty in the future might bring, that we come to our series of what it means to not only feel and carry these burdens, but how we release them to God. Mm -hmm. And so today we're talking about the burden of morality. Now, a lot of times we might feel that this is a heaviness of a weight of what we do or don't do that is right or wrong, but As uh, Taylor and I have been studying this passage and this concept over the past week together, what we have recognized is that morality is really a gift. It is a gift that God gives us to care for one another so that all creation might flourish. Yeah, so we start, want to start by asking the question, what is morality? When you hear that term, uh, there's a lot of different definitions about that. And so we kind of came to the group senses, the, the collaborative consensus, that morality is the study of what's right and wrong. But beyond that, morality is really about human flourishing. Um, arguably more than that, it's about creation's flourishing, because uh, in order for humanity to flourish, we have to be a part of creation in a good way. We talked a few weeks ago about uh, the burden of the ego, and it's always a humbling reminder that we as human beings are a part of creation as well. But when we talk about morality as well, we often talk or think about two different types of morality. So there's theoretical morality, and there's also practical morality. The former, theoretical morality, is is important. It's about uh, discussing, it's kind of more of the scholarly work, the dialogue. What does it mean for humanity to flourish? Asking that question, philosophical thought about that. What, What does human good look like? What does human flourishing look like? How should we do that? Practical morality, of course, then is putting it into practice, putting uh, where the rubber hits the road. You might think of the image of a professional football player, an athlete. You know, they arguably know the art form of football incredibly well, whereas a reporter who's reporting on the game of football know, might arguably know the, the rules of the game more than the football player. They get to kind of sit back, see both the offense and defense playing at the same time, and to see how well a, a play, a Hail Mary or a shotgun was, uh, was executed. 
I have no idea what any of those I, plays. Would I don't be. really much but either. Yes, <laughs> <It's fine. laughs> but it does get to the point of what it means to look at morality not just from one particular perspective. And I think a lot of times when we think about morality, we think about like the Levitical laws mm -hmm. um, in the Bible and how it says, you know, God said, "Yo, oh, you're supposed to do this, and you're not supposed to do this." Um, and and we get caught up a lot in morality being, oh, this is right and this is wrong, and then you know, caught up in a sense of judgment even right. of other people of what they've done is wrong and what I've done is right but rather morality even in the Levitical laws you know when it was talking about you know don't wear clothes that are blended clothes and don't eat shellfish I mean it was designed not to say shellfish are bad because I everyone knows shellfish, shellfish is good, is good. <laughs> everybody likes shellfish uh, but uh, but that it really was designed to protect the people of Israel from harm, and it was designed to promote their flourishing. And so when we think about morality, not in terms of do's and don'ts, but rather in terms of how is this decision promoting creation's flourishing kind of gives us a different perspective on what this means. Right, and so we see um, the relevancy of more of morality in our daily lives, whether we're attuned to it, tuned into it or not. You know, for example, uh, we, incur we encounter moral dilemmas all the time. If you go to a store and on the shelf you can choose between the organic, fair trade, uh, like, good ground coffee or like Folgers, you have the decision, do I spend a little bit more and support people who are living in, you know, making a living rate wage and are supported better, or do I get a little more coffee at a little bit cheaper rate? Right. Um, not tasting as good. Not tasting as good, good. yeah. You <laughs> Sorry just roast for those it of you Folgers. Who like Folgers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we're, we encounter these moral dilemmas um, all of the time, and some of them aren't as close to home. They don't seem to affect us uh, that that personally, and my wife, uh, Katie, shout out to Katie if you're listening, um, you know, she said the other day in the midst of the COVID uh, pandemic that, you know, like early on with the coronavirus, it didn't seem like that big of a deal mm -hmm. until things around her started shutting down and until people that we knew were being more closely affected. And it seems like morality, moral issues don't, aren't, we're not theoretically thinking about them unless they're really close to home a lot of times. Practical, yeah. Well, and I mean, to, to your point, like we're literally living moral theology mm -hmm. right now. Like, uh, I mean, we all took moral theology in seminary, right? But, but like this is, this is in practice. And, and so, uh, for instance, one of my, a couple of my friends have children who have underlying health concerns. Mm -hmm. And so there have been posting, you know, as their children have been going into the hospital, um, you know, this, this statement that keeps being made that only the vulnerable are susceptible mm -hmm. to COVID-19, their post is, your only is my everything. Mm -hmm. And so recognizing the impact that all of our decisions are making, for instance, social distancing that can impact yeah. um, those that we may not even know but those whose lives are just as valuable to God for flourishing. So when we don't have the perspective of the reporter who can see the whole game, it gets really confusing. What decision do I make in this moment, especially if the script hasn't been written for us? And, um, you know, that's where we can go to Scripture a lot of times. Scripture provides avenues for us to reflect on and model moral behavior. But I think to your point about the Levitical Code, sometimes we get so wrapped up in the little minutia that we kind of forget the big theme. And so one of the themes that I wanted to highlight was um, that from the beginning of the book of Genesis to the end of the book of Revelation, the entire scripture, uh, scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament alike, God and Jesus continually call us and command us to care for three groups of people, the widows, the orphans, and the stranger, which in that society and early, uh, and arguably even still today, um, these are the most vulnerable among us. God wants us to care for the vulnerable among us so that even the vulnerable can flourish. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the great news is right now we're seeing that in practice a lot of places. Um, some really cool stories 
have been coming out about how uh, there are those who are making some self-sacrificial choices to care for the most vulnerable. I was, uh, you'll like this story, I was uh, reading or, or watching about a distillery, uh, about three distilleries actually, uh, w uh, some in Atlanta and some in Oregon, who are, instead of making whiskey right now, they're taking that raw alcohol and they're making antibacterial uh, soap. And If that's and a sacrifice I need to make, yeah. if there's not as much <laughs> bourbon on hand for people to be, I'll make the sacrifice. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and, and they're just passing it out for free mm, because you know it's there's there's not enough to go around right now and then um, another story that I was hearing about you know people who are posting on next door app and just making sure that their neighbors around mm -hmm. them even if they don't know them uh, neighbors who may not be able to get out because they're they're older or they're more vulnerable they're making sure that they get the supplies that they need right now and I just think those are just such great examples yeah. of how people are really putting their best foot forward and caring for the most vulnerable right now definitely and so yeah. scripture is full of these stories stories uh, that highlight kind of moral issues or, or really dilemmas that we get ourselves in. We place those burdens often on ourselves, uh, but but show that show how God and, and is working hope out in the midst of them. And so one of the stories we want to uh, have you all turn to today, whether you have a Bible handy, feel free to open to it. If you're watching on a computer, open a new tab and just do that. If your kid's sitting next to to you and they're playing on their phone, just snag it from them and grab mm -hmm. their Bible yeah. app or something, whatever <laughs> feels right to you. But we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through the end of the chapter. A couple of things about this passage. So um, I'm reading from the New Revised uh, Standard Version, the NRSV, uh, good old classic Methodist version. Um, and my Bible calls this story a sinful woman forgiven. Uh, I always encourage people to pay attention to the subtitles and to not put too much weight in those because a lot of times the subtitles of stories can really influence how you read into right. the story. Um, but interestingly, th interesting thing about this passage in particular is that it's one of the few passages that shows up in all four Gospels. So mm -hmm. um, I, I think I remember them, but I'll just have you go research them. That's your homework this week. Go check them out and compare <laughs> how Luke uh, compares this story to Matthew, Mark, and John as well. Um, so how about I read through 40, and then if you want to pick up sure. at 41, Alex? Yep. Okay. So Luke 7, 36. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and Jesus went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with ointment. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw it, when he saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now, which will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one to whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven Hence she has shown great love, but the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The word, word of, of God, God for the people, people of God. God. Thanks, Thanks be to, to God. God. Amen. 
I love this interpretation, or I love this passage. One of the ways that I kind of inter- interpret it and approach it is, you know, we, I think we should start with who are the cast of characters. So you have Jesus, first and foremost. He is the popular prophet. He is the healer who is said to heal things no one else could heal. He is uh, the guy who is performing miracles that no one else could perform. Um, he is the talk of the town, the crowd sensation. Then you've got this unnamed woman um, that we don't know much about. Other gospels speculate maybe she was Mary Magdalene. Other people speculate on like what her job was. But Luke just tells us uh, not her name, but simply that she is, uh, has the reputation of being a sinner. And then you've got Simon the Pharisee. And I always encourage people also in Bible studies, when, when somebody in, in Scripture has a name, you usually want to pay attention because that means that that person is important. Not very many people are named in Scripture unless they are significant. And so we can speculate a little bit about this Simon the Pharisee as, we, as the story and the scene unfolds. And so what that scene looks like is that Simon the Pharisee, this privileged uh, religious elite male, wants to throw a dinner party. And I always think that like these are a little lost on us because they're probably not like the casual dinner parties that we have every now and then. I think these are like great gatsby style (laughs) parties like everyone knows about them and just like a great gatsby party apparently at this one there's supposed to be a phenomenal guest of honor and that's jesus and so uh, in my mind i suppose that that simon is thinking well if i get jesus to come to this party then everyone will who comes will know that i know the lord that i invited jesus that i got the crowd sensation to come to my house and it's only going to encourage his uh his elite status as well So he's throwing this big dinner party. The guest list is set. The RSVPs have been returned. The menu is fixed. The food is prepared. Uh, The fine china and the white linens are laid out. Uh, The servants are there ready and willing to sweep up the crumbs between meals. Sounds Um, like so much work. I know. It really does. (laughs) Sounds exhausting. I'm I'm exhausted just thinking about it. (laughs) Things are going well. Powerful and privileged people are showing up to the party. And then a moral dilemma strikes Mm -hmm. because... Here she comes. In comes this woman who is not invited. Right. She wasn't on the guest list. And I can only imagine Simon is thinking, who let her across the border? <laughs> right. You know, this is my house. This is my yeah. party. This is about this work, me. Right? I yeah. did all this work. Who let her in? And the woman crashes the dinner party. And when she crashes the dinner party, she commits two moral kind of issues or crimes that would have been uh, severe in in Israelite culture. One, she crosses a social boundary, a social crime. Um, It would have been unheard of for women, but particularly a singular woman, to go to a party of all men uh, in this day and age. Likewise, uh, so she commits that social boundary, and then she crosses a religious boundary because um, as a sinner, like Luke tells us she is, Anything that she touches would have made her ritually unclean and would have made all those things unclean as well. To make matters worse, to add insult to injury, she is embarrassing everyone because she's cutting up and acting a fool. She's she's causing a scene. She's weeping and wailing and whining and and um, maybe not the whining. Maybe not the whining. She's weeping and wailing and crying and uh, I think it's like it's like a NASCAR scene. You know, like you don't want to look, but you can't look away. and Good I imagine, analogy. thank yeah. you, thank you. <laughs> I imagine Simon in his head is thinking like, you know, I just want to take care of this issue. I just want to get her to leave. There's a problem. Let's just get rid of it. But then a bigger problem arises, and that's that this woman has gotten to Jesus, mm-hmm. and Jesus is entertaining her. And so, so Simon thinks to himself, Scripture tells us, he thinks to himself, well, if Jesus just knew who and what sort of woman this is that was touching him, well, he wouldn't be acting like that. Mm-hmm. But then notice that when Simon thinks it, Jesus perceives it. Jesus hears it. Jesus can feel something is not right in the room. Mm -hmm. And I think everything hinges on the question that he asks. Do you see this woman? Seems like an obvious question, but verse uh, 39 actually reads in the Greek and in in the NRSV, um, I think he asked this question because it says, when Simon the Pharisee saw it. Jesus asks, do you see her? Because he knew that all Simon the Pharisee saw was an it. Simon didn't see a woman whose heart hungered for the Lord, and Jesus instead begs this question of him, and it's a question that invites him not to see a sinner, but to see a soul. 
not to see a number, but to see a name, not to see an issue, but to see an identity, not to see a statistic, but to hear a story. Jesus does not see a problem. Jesus sees a person. Exactly. And I think one of the things that this gives us an example of is a beautiful expression of how Jesus embodies God's morality. Um, and that Jesus is embodying how it is that we are called into moral action for all human flourishing. And he does this in a couple of ways, of course. The first way that he does this is by embracing this woman in um, not only a generous love and forgiveness, but in releasing her from kind of the shame culture mm -hmm. that she's experienced and how it is that he is valuing her presence by kind of giving her as an example uh, to Simon of saying, look at what she has done for me. He's taking her out of that shame culture and recognizing her, as you said, as a person, not an it. And what is so interesting is he does the same thing for Simon, the Pharisee, but in a much different way. He does that by, by calling Simon out, yeah. basically, and saying, you know, Simon, I need you to, to, to see this as a, this person as a person and recognizing that she deserves this human flourishing too, and that, that sometimes we too have to kind of be called out, uh, called into yeah. question of how it is that we are recognizing the humanity of all people. And particularly in this time as we are, you know, watching all of these statistics on these screens and the numbers keep going up, as we see those numbers, I think God is asking us to embody mm -hmm. that more moral decision to say, this is not a number, this is a name, yeah. <laughs> right? This is not a statistic. This is a this is a person. This is this is, these are people's lives. These are families, and so we we pray for them and we feel that connection with them. Um, uh, Hans Kung actually says there is no survival without a global ethic, mm -hmm. and I love the way that 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 connects us as humanity of saying my choices impact you you directly um not just my neighbor but yeah. uh, my international brother or sister from the smallest Christ. distillery to yes. the largest corporation every act matters every yeah. act matters and so when we start to think about how it is that you uh, how how you all are are embodying that moral theology this week i want to encourage you to continue to um to think about each of these persons, not um, as a country that we should shame for causing some kind of epidemic, but rather as people who are literally suffering right alongside the rest of the world. As we are looking at doctors and nurses that are making these difficult moral decisions of who to care for and how to care for them, that we, um, we pray for them as a way of embodying that moral theology as we are looking at um, how it is that we um, consider God caring for the least and the lost and the most vulnerable, we make that decision, even if it's inconvenient for us, mm -hmm. to social distance to protect those who are the most vulnerable. And so uh, as we think about all of these prayers <laughs> that we have this week for doctors, for nurses, for our leaders who are making these decisions to uh, connect and share information for uh, countries of, of China and Germany and Italy, um, for all people who are uh, walking alongside us in this global epidemic, we pray. We pray that we can have the wisdom <laughs> to see the big picture of how God is utilizing this as a gift to give us. Not that God is causing this, not that God has made this happen, but that how God can even take the worst situation and make good come out of it. That perhaps this can be a gift for us to see one another in a different way, in a time that has been some of the most divisive in our nation, in our world, to bring us together, to connect us as a global community. 
And so we pray. We pray for that, um, knowing that that is what God wants, is all creation's flourishing. As we listen to this song today, uh, we listen to Lord God Almighty. We come to God in the assurance that it is God's gift to us that all humanity, all creation should flourish. And so we're going to invite you to uh, pray, to put your prayer requests out there on Facebook Live. And Taylor's going to be watching watching those as he puts those prayers together in our prayers of the people time. Just take a moment and type in your prayers on Facebook Live as we listen together these assuring words that God the Almighty is at work in us for the moral gift of what it is so that all humanity and all creation may flourish. The, as I watch these prayer concerns coming in, just invite you to go back this week and look at um, all of the prayer concerns that have been lifted up and let this be your prayer list this week. Let, um, let your morning and evenings be saturated in conversations with God. And I invite you to lift up these names and these concerns that are on the heart of your prayer family. And I would, uh, I would, 
guests, the family of our entire world. And so now let us go to God in prayer and I'll do my best to capture as many of these as I can. And I uh, apologize in advance if we don't get all of them. Let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God, we come to you and give thanks to you for who you are, for a God that loves creation so much that you would be in social solidarity with us as you become incarnate in the Son, Jesus Christ. And we model after his life and ministry what it means to have a moral ethic that cares for the flourishing of all people. And so today we lift up prayers. We pray for Witherspoon Distillery in Louisville who has um, sacrificed some of their financial income to help those uh, who are in need uh, creating PPE. We pray for the pregnant families out there as well as those who have newborn children on the way. Uh, in these uncertain times, we ask that your Holy Spirit care for those children, for those mothers, uh, and that they feel your presence in the creation of new things in this midst. Likewise, we also pray for those who are recently de uh, deceased, um, that their legacy not be forgotten and for the families who are uh, surely missing them now more than ever, may they feel comforted in the phone calls and the emails as they come forth. We pray also, God, for those who have lost jobs or who are feeling financially insecure about their future. God, uh, we just pray for our leaders that they might uh, find a way collectively and creatively empowered by your Holy Spirit to support an economy that can help sustain the flourishing of all people. For anxiety, for parents who are struggling to teach and be with their children 24-7, we pray for them. We pray for teachers who have devoted their entire lives to helping educate our children. And we pray for our children, one of the vulnerable among us, for those who are food insecure and for those who know where their next meal will be come from, that they will not drive their parents crazy, but that they will be loving and helpful in the days to come. God, for those who are alone in hospital, nursing homes, memory care units, we pray that they feel your warm presence through those workers and hospital uh, staff, those nursing home workers who have devoted their lives to the ministry of healing. For God, we know that it is a ministry. That being said, we lift up also those who are working tirelessly on the front lines to fight uh, the coronavirus, as well as those who are working behind the scenes to uh, create vaccines and stop the spread of this virus. For those who are food insecure, those who are sheltering alone, those who are isolated, we pray that they know that this faith community in Flower Mound, uh, Flower Mound Texas, as well as the church community across the globe, wants them to know that God loves them and that God wants to see them flourish. We pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, as he taught us to pray this prayer together, which we now encourage you to pray with us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know, the beautiful words of this song, how can we tell you how much we love you? Take now our lives, Lord and teach us to love. Those are beautiful words that um, were sung to us as a way of saying we want to offer ourselves to you, God. And, and I know that right now it's kind of an odd time to say it's a time to offer of ourselves, but I think you have already offered of yourself by being Amen. present, being on Facebook Live, by, by praying and continuing to pray. And though we may not be able to do the, the hands-on mission work that we are used 
used to doing as Flower Mound United Methodist Church, we are still a body of Christ, being the hands and feet of Christ to the world, even if it looks a little bit different. Um, we have gone to a virtual online church <laughs> this week, and our staff has worked so hard. We're so thankful for everybody who has made this happen today behind the scenes, and we want to just invite you to continue to offer of your financial gifts this week as we know we're in some uncertain times knowing that we have your financial gift gives us certainty for the future and the ministries of flower mound united methodist church that you are proclaiming with all your faith i know god is good i know god has continued to be at work in this church and and i know that what we are doing here at flower mound united methodist church is something that i am a part of and want to continue to be a part of so um, if you can go online and actually make your financial gift online, what's super helpful for us is if that's an ACH gift or a recurring gift. And the reason is because that provides us the financial stability uh, for our budgeting process as we plan and prepare for the future um, because we know that we have a bright, bright future ahead as far as Mount United Methodist Church. And so we want to encourage you to go online to make that gift today um, because online is kind of the way we're going to be going for the future yeah. and Taylor has put together some great things on our website I'd like him to tell sure. you about. So if you go to flowermount, uh, fmumc.org at the top of our webpage you'll see a drop down tab called community during COVID-19 and on that page which we're doing our best to uh, update regularly you'll find information about ways that you can get involved in discipleship ministries, ways you can still be involved in missions, uh, as well as pastoral care. So whether that's receiving pastoral care calls or making pastoral care calls. As far as discipleship goes, we're going to be working on uh, creating a list of any group that is open for you to uh, participate in Zoom meetings, uh, as well as we would encourage you to sign up for an intentional discipleship relationship. And basically, you just go on, fill out a short survey, and we'll match you with someone who's kind of in the same phase of life as you for y'all to uh, practice intentionally reaching out to one another. But ultimately, we also want to give you permission that if right now you are feeling that you just need to take a step back, we hope you'll do that. And uh, even if you do that, we hope that uh, you will continue to reach out to your faith community, to your larger neighborhood community, whoever that is, but that you'll send text messages and emails and phone calls and let people know that they're cared for, that they are cared for, and that you're thinking about them. And this is the way that we offer ourselves. It's the biblical way that we offer ourselves. And when we think about how God is continually, persistently, steadfastly offering of God's self throughout the biblical witness from, uh, from the ways in which that Abraham is called and Moses and the Israelites are cared for in the wilderness all the way until um, God comes in human form in the incarnate Christ and how the ministry of the church has and continues used to um, thrive through the presence of the Holy Spirit. We know that God is faithful. The Bible tells us so. And so um, as we listen to this song, the Bible tells us so. Please go online and offer of yourself uh, to God in the gracious way in which God has offered God's self to you.
<laughs> I love it. That was beautiful. Thanks, y'all. Well, it is that time of our service where we typically would uh, invite you to go from this place, <laughs> but instead today we're going to invite you to remain in place. Remain it is your house. Yes. arguably <laughs> the moral and right and good thing to do, uh, but we want to leave you with this benediction. Uh, as you practice social distancing, know that God loves you and God cares deeply for your and all of creation's flourishing. So in those little moments, whether they're frustrating or anxiety producing, rest assured that God is with you and that your faith can sustain you. Amen. And now we're going to sing a final song that our church here at Flower Mountain United Methodist Church has been singing for 20-something years in the mm -hmm. closeout of services. Yeah. And so if you know it uh, while you're at home, belt it out for all yeah. to hear. <laughs>